Good morning. Good morning. I know that many of you are here to learn how to free climb El Capitan. That would be the next speaker. I want to talk to you about a challenge that you're much more likely to face, and that's digital transformation. Um, you know, John Doerr, who's a pretty well-known venture capitalist at Kleiner Perkins and something of a futurist, talks about technology disruption coming in 13-year waves. And so if we start in 1981 with the personal computer, we all know the impact that had on virtually every business as we moved through decentralized and lower cost computing. If we move another 13 years, 1994, the internet. Now, I know the internet actually was invented earlier, but 94 was the year that um, it really went commercial. It was the year that the World Wide Web cleared a million web addresses. It was the year that businesses started to take notice and start to think about how they were going to re-engineer themselves to take advantage of it. 13 years later, what happened in 2007? The iPhone, June 2007, the iPhone and mobile and smartphones have transformed virtually every business. And so if you go another 13 years, you get to 2020, there's supposed to be a lot of suspense there. <laughs> um, that's kind of blown. So you can imagine what's there. It's AI. <laughs> and, um, and we really think that that's, that's the next uh, wave, the next disruptive wave. Um, you know, when I was a McKinsey consultant a long time ago, 30 years ago I was a McKinsey consultant, um, there were really two approaches to solving a problem. Um, the first approach, the more elegant approach, was hypothesis-driven. You'd have a problem, you'd develop a hypothesis, you'd go find the data that you needed, you'd think about what an analysis you needed to do to solve the problem. And um, I, I was one of those consultants. The, um, the other approach, which we pejoratively termed, well, the ocean, um, was held in lower regard. These were the consultants who burned up teams. These were the consultants who worked nights and weekends. They didn't know where they were looking or what they were looking for. They looked under every rock. They looked at every scrap of data, hoping to divine some insight. The last thing you wanted to do at McKinsey in the late 80s was work for a boil the ocean engagement manager. Well, the joke is on me, because in our world, um, AI has really transformed that. And, and now boil the ocean is no longer an insult. In our world of decisioning, things are changing. We, um, we used, to, we used to, to, in order to solve a problem, we used to go find the single data set that had the most predictive value and, um, and, and use it. Today, with lower costs of mixing and matching data, structured and unstructured data, we're able to take advantage of that incremental data to make a better decision. What are the implications? Um, it's going to transform financial services as we know it. Um, now, if we, um, if we look at financial services, let's go back in time. We'll go back to 1981, 40 years ago, roughly the time of deregulation. And um, at that time, financial services in the US was about 5% of GDP. 13 years later, it had climbed from 5% to 6%. 13 years after that, in 2007, we were up to 7.5%. And today, financial services as a percent of GDP is up to around 8%. And so the question is, where do we go from here? Does the trend continue? Do trees grow to the sky? Or uh, do we see that curve bend back downward? I believe that we could see financial services as a percent of GDP drop to 5 or 6% over the next decade. I've seen estimates that over the next 10 years, a trillion dollars of cost will be cut in the front, middle, and back offices. So the greatest opportunity is going to be for financial services firms that learn how to leverage this technology. Now, we are awash in data. We know that. But what we also know is that we're only using half of 1% of the data. 99% of the data is, is basically being wasted. And the promise of AI here is that we're going to get some incremental value, some caloric value out of that other 99%. And that'll lead to better decision making. OK, I'd, uh, I'd like to talk to you now about blueberry muffins and chihuahuas. I know that's kind of a tough segue, but there they are. 
And um, they really look a lot alike. And so the, the, early, the early AI guys thought, this would be really a great exercise. Let's see if a machine can distinguish between chihuahuas and blueberry muffins. And they went at it, and amazingly, they got to 30% error rates. Now, you should know that by contrast, human beings, they're not 100%. Human beings have a 5% error rate. Um, but an interesting thing happened. A, a computer professor, computer science professor at Stanford decided to load 10 million images into a database and trained an algorithm to differentiate between blue, blueberry muffins and chihuahuas. And he wound up bringing that error rate down to 3%. So the future is really, it's training algorithms and uh, leveraging all that incremental data. And we're, we're in a world where we can really start to do that. Um, banks are gonna become radically more efficient. Customer engagement's gonna get a lot better at lower cost. Um, and at McKinsey, boil the ocean will no longer be an insult. Um, where within financial services are we going to see the biggest impact from AI? I'll, I'll just share a few ideas. I think um, compliance is one area. Customer engagement is a second area. A third is authentication security. And let's just go through them one by one. Um, compliance. We know that uh, money laundering uh, is a tremendous problem. Something like $45 billion a year is spent on uh, AML-related compliance. And in spite of that, tens of billions of dollars of fines have been paid by financial institutions over the last 10 years. So not working that well. The UN estimates that between 3 and 5% of global GDP is illicit activity. That's $1 to $2 trillion. What's amazing is that we're only catching about 1% of that. There's only like 1% enforcement. And so um, there's, there's obviously a lot of room for improvement. I think AI can dramatically reduce compliance costs and reduce the false positives. Customer engagement. We know, you all know, that uh, over half of adults prefer a contact channel other than a human call center agent. If you go to millennials, 90% would prefer not to deal with a human call center in Egypt. Any other channel would be better. And yet we also know that the bots, the chat bots we use today are pretty primitive, pretty crude, and they do an okay job, not that great a job. But the promise of in the future is that we have AI-driven bots that really handle things well. You see here a picture of uh, Flo. Those of you in the US probably are familiar with her. She's, um, she's the spokesperson for progressive insurance. And she's got a big personality. Um, what Progressive did was they, they developed an AI-driven bot that, has, uh, that can handle natural language queries, that can provide natural language responses. And they watched um, the followership explode. And on Facebook, they went from half a million followers to five million followers because the bot's really good. OK, three. Third, I identity authentication. Um, I think authentication goes to the heart of what financial services firms have to do. I mean, if you don't get the authentication right, everything else bad follows. So, um, so it's, it's core to the value proposition. And yet we know today it's, it's a friction-prone process. We have passwords. We reset passwords. We forget passwords. We have two-step authentication. It's clunky. It's full of friction. Consumers hate it. I believe that we're going to see authentication evolve along two paths. Uh, for many firms, maybe even most firms, I think we'll see authentication through the big four, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google. I mean, the reality is these guys have very good authentication, and they have relationships with everyone. And so it's, it's convenient and easy to authenticate through one of them, and we've all seen it. But not every firm is going to want to authenticate through those four. And um, for those, I see this alternate path, which is wrapped around developing um, behavioral biometrics. And this is an AI-driven kind of authentication approach, where we look and read thousands of signals um, to, to provide the authentication. And those signals are provided by your mobile phone. I mean, it's, it's how you walk. It's how you type. Moving from an 8% of GDP world to a 5% of GDP world. 
that's, at some level, that's about the money. And we know that the, the costs are coming down, the spending is coming down. And, um, and, you know, there's notable people in the industry who've mentioned this, right? Vikram Pandit, former CEO of Citibank, predicted two years ago that in the next five years, 30% of banking jobs would be lost. Brian Moynihan at Bank of America has cut 100,000 jobs attributable to technology. So I think we're going to see, we're going to see tremendous uh, change. Um, financial institutions that have navigated their digital transformation successfully are going to wind up competing with each other at much lower cost and, frankly, serving their customers a little bit better. Now, I think that the future is not AI by itself, and it's not just people doing it anymore, it's the combination, human and machine intelligence combined. And I'd like to give you just a couple of examples of what I mean. Um, Harvard University did a study uh, to, identify, to figure out how accurately pathologists can um, identify cancerous breast cells. And the pathologists are pretty good, 96%. They, um, they set AI on the problem, and AI only produced results of 92%. Human beings are still better. But the combination, when they put the two together, they got to 99.5% accuracy rates. And I think that's, that's testament to the power of putting these two together. Another example, for those of you who are here in 2018, Gary Kasparov was our keynote speaker, the world chess champion. Uh, was the world chess champion until he was beaten by IBM's deep blue computer. Um, he, he, he didn't like that at the time, but he's since come around and he, what he believes is that the future of chess is centaur chess, what he calls centaur chess, which is the combination of human judgment and human creativity coupled with the flawless execution of, of AI machine. So before I close, or as I close, I just want to make a couple of comments about um, how we see FICO, what we think our mission is. Um, I'm, you know, I'm often asked, what, what is it that FICO does really well? What, what do you guys do better than everybody else? What's your differentiated competence? And the answer to that is, we are really good at predicting consumer behavior. We're good at predicting consumer behavior and turning it into decisions, and taking those decisions and putting them into workflows, and getting them into operations. For what purpose? So that we can optimize interactions with consumers. And that's our mission. Our mission is to have the preeminent decisioning platform for B2C companies to optimize their interactions with consumers. So I hope over the next couple of days, you'll learn a lot about AI, you'll learn more about our capabilities, and I hope that you'll reach out to us so that we can help you with your digital transformation. Thank you.